Welcome everyone to the Medications and Scleroderma panel session. I'm Jennifer Cooper. I'm a pediatric rheumatologist at the Children's Hospital of Colorado, and I'm also a former pharmacist. And I'd like to welcome you to today's discussion. We are going to have a short presentation where I'm going to review common medications that are used in juvenile localized and systemic sclerosis. And then we're going to talk a little bit about tips for managing medications from my perspective. And then we're going to open it up to a larger panel that's made up of some nurses, parents, and patients with medical training. So I think we'll have a great session for you. And we definitely don't want you to be shy at the end. We want you to ask your questions. And feel free to enter things into the chat as we go. So thinking about medication categories for scleroderma, we think about juvenile localized scleroderma and juvenile systemic sclerosis. And the treatments really overlap for these two conditions in terms of the medications that we use to target the immune system. So this is made up of traditional what we call DMARDs or disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs which are some of the older medications we've been using for a long time, including methotrexate and steroids that you may be familiar with. And then also a newer category of medications called biologics, which are specifically engineered medicines to target specific molecules in the immune system. And then for juvenile localized scleroderma, there are some topical medications that could be used. And then for systemic sclerosis, one of the other key medication categories that we need are blood vessel dilators or relaxers. This is called vasodilators. And then gut motility agents. So we'll go through some of these uh, medications now. So just an example, example regimens for someone with juvenile systemic sclerosis, the role of the medicines is to calm the disease down with the immunomodulator or immunosuppressive agents. And we do this by targeting inflammation and the fibrosis that's happening, and also to dilate the blood vessels. For juvenile localized scleroderma, we want to use medications to calm the, to calm the disease. And the treatment will really depend on the patient's age and growth potential and how much skin is involved and where it's involved but we also want to use medicines that target the immune system to reduce inflammation and fibrosis. Now, methotrexate is one of the first medications that we've used for a lot of autoimmune conditions. It's very well established as a first-line treatment for scleroderma skin disease. And for patients that have localized scleroderma, approximately 75% will respond to this medicine. It works by blocking a protein that's important for white blood cell production, and then that subsequently will help decrease the activity of the immune system. And it's given as an injection under the skin that's called subcutaneous or by mouth once a week or every seven days. And it's also given with folic acid that's a vitamin that you take every day to help reduce some of the side effects. And one of the issue with uh, methotrexate is really tolerability. It's not usually a toxicity problem. It does require monitoring the liver function and the blood cell counts, but the common side effects we see are oral ulcers and nausea. And the nausea happens um, usually after the dose and happens in about 40 or 50 percent of patients. And some patients have some fatigue after the dose for about 24 hours or so. And one of the main things that we deal with in clinical practice is trying to combat this nausea. And we have a variety of ways to do this. We can use anti-nausea medicines. You may have heard of something called ondansetron or Zofran. And sometimes people will take this before they even do their injection and then for the 24 hours after. We can also try switching to injections if somebody is on the pills because the subcutaneous injections have a lower rate of nausea. We can also try small dose reductions, or if someone's taking the pills, sometimes we'll split the dose over the day, like morning and night, or between one or two days. 
The next medication is called mycophenolate mofetil, which is known as Celsept. And this also works by blocking a protein in white blood cells, but a different one. And it leads to decreased immune system activity. This medicine is considered a little bit stronger than methotrexate, and it can also be used for patients that have lung involvement. It's given by mouth two times a day, and it's available as a suspension, which is a liquid, or as tablets or capsules. And the most common side effects are stomach upset or diarrhea, and this usually improves with time, and that's a reason that we go up slowly on the dose over the course of a week or two. It can cause birth defects, so if someone's having a pregnant, planning a pregnancy, we'll have to switch to a different medicine, but there's no long-term impacts on fertility. And if the GI symptoms like the diarrhea are persistent, then it can be an option to switch to another formulation of the same, um, the same medication that's called mycophenolic sodium or myfortic. Now, corticosteroids, we call these steroids for short, they work very broadly to quickly reduce the activity of the immune system, and they work very well to do this. However, the main problem with these medicines are some of the short-term and long-term side effects. So this is usually just a short-term medicine over for a few months or so. It, you can give steroids by mouth, which is oral, called prednisone if it's a pill or prednisolone if it's a liquid. There's also another steroid we sometimes use called dexamethasone. And this is usually given once or twice a day and then will be tapered or that means decreased slowly over time. And then the IV medication called solumedrol, this is a, a key medicine for people that have localized um, scleroderma lesion. Sometimes they'll get these infusions weekly or, or once a month, and this can also help quickly calm inflammation. So some of the short-term side effects are increased appetite, weight gain, can cause stretch marks, some irritability or mood changes, difficulty sleeping, and acne. It does suppress the immune system, so you do have an increased risk of infections on these medicines but it can also cause cataracts in the eyes, decreased growth, and can increase risk for diabetes and low bone density or osteoporosis in the long run. So we really try to minimize the use of steroids, but they are very important at certain times. Uh, they're a key medicine in the short term. And then IVIG, which stands for intravenous immune globulin, this actually works in many, many different ways to decrease the immune system activity or modulate the immune system activity. It doesn't suppress the immune system, meaning it doesn't increase risk for getting infections, but it changes um, how the immune system is responding in a good way when you have an autoimmune disease. In scleroderma treatment, it's primarily used for skin disease, and it's usually given every few weeks or once a month the infusions are several hours long, and the main side effects are infusion reactions. Sometimes we have to slow the infusions down or headaches afterwards. And then the biologic class, we're fortunately getting more and more options. These medicines target specific cells or specific molecules. Actemra is called tocilizumab. This blocks a molecule called interleukin-6, which can cause inflammation, and it's actually FDA approved to treat systemic sclerosis associated lung disease in adults. And this is available as subcutaneous injections or IV infusions, and you, we have to monitor labs pretty regularly. We look for low blood counts, we look at the liver function, and we look at effects on cholesterol. And then some other options are abatacept, known as orencia, which blocks a signal that activates a certain type of white blood cells called T cells. And this is also available as subcutaneous injections or IV infusions. And this one can is kind of notorious for taking a long time to start working. So all immune system suppressants can sometimes take three months at least to really start seeing the benefit, but abatacept can take, I think, at least six months sometimes. 
And then another option is rituximab. And this works by depleting a specific type of white blood cell called B cells. So it will knock out these B cells. And these are the cells in your body that make proteins called antibodies that help recognize viruses and bacteria that you, you know, the body's been exposed to before. And so one of the side effects of this medicine is that it will decrease protective levels of antibodies. So that's something that we take into consideration before giving this medicine. And it's usually given as two doses through an IV up front. Those are usually about two weeks apart. And then we repeat it again in six months. There are some other medications that we used for systemic sclerosis in particular or very severe cases of localized scleroderma. These include cyclophosphamide. There's a an newer anti-fibrotic uh, medicine that targets fibrosis, and then newer, a newer class of oral medicines called Janus kinase inhibitors. There's not a lot of data on the Janus kinase inhibitors yet, but stay tuned because I think in the next coming years, we'll be talking more about some of these medicines too. And then the next group of medications would be blood vessel dilators or vasodilators. These are medicines that help relax the, the muscle that's in the blood vessel lining. So this helps improve blood flow. And the key medication category here are calcium channel blockers. And this would be the, usually the first line treatment that we use for Raynaud's. And this is used for people that have scleroderma, but also for people that have primary Raynaud's. These, the, some of the names of these are nifedipine or amlodipine. And these are generally really well-tolerated medicines. Some people have issues with some dizziness or headaches. So that's something that we take into consideration when we um, figure out the best dose for someone. And then other options are phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors like sildenafil. This also help improve, improve blood flow. So if the calcium channel blockers aren't really cutting it for someone, that's another option. And we also uh, can use some topical things like nitropaste to help dilate the blood vessel finger to the blood vessels at the fingertips, especially for people that are getting problems with ulcers on their fingertips. And then some that there are medicines that can help increase motility of the intestines. And this is important because sometimes people with systemic sclerosis can get fibrosis that's affecting how the intestines are moving. So some options here are erythromycin, which is a common antibiotic, but it also happens to work on motility receptors in the gut called motilin receptors. And it's used in a low dose two or three times a day to try to improve motility in the gut. Other options are ciproheptidine, which is an antihistamine. This helps work with motility, but it also has an added benefit of boosting appetite. So it's good for certain people that might be struggling with appetite. And then a third medicine is called metoclopramide or Reglan. This also enhances gut motility and you take it before meals three or four times a day. It does have some other side effects. So usually we'll try the other medicines first, but it does work very well. And then it's also important to treat gastroesophageal reflux that's pretty common. In, in people that have systemic sclerosis. And this is treated with acid blockers or acid reducers. And then medication management. This, we just covered a lot of medications and we didn't really talk about that. We often use the immunosuppressant medications in combination. So this could, you could easily end up with a lot of medicines to manage every day. So staying organized is really important. One way to do that is with a pill box that has as many compartments as you need. So there, this one is showing a picture of AM and PM dosing, but there are some that have compartments for three or four times a day. And then there's also a service called Pill Pack that would package up your medications that are due at a certain time altogether. 
But if you're taking meds out of the child safe containers, it's really important to make sure that you're still storing these things safely. Blood pressure medicines in particular can be uh, very, could be lethal to young children if they took them. So we really want to make sure we're storing medications in a safe place. And then the other thing I find helpful is to use a reminder system. So there are some apps that some people use. I think it's also just simple to set alarms on the phone that go off every day in the morning and at night or whenever you're supposed to take medications. And then using for injections that you may not take as, as frequently as every day, you can set a recurring calendar reminder or you could remind yourself that you're supposed to reduce a prednisone dose and trying to do those things in advance can help. And then I think also paper charts, I wouldn't uh, throw those by the wayside. Sometimes it's really helpful for kids to be able to mark off, you know, check, I took my medications that day or put on the calendar in advance, you know, decreased prednisone or, or I have an infusion that day. And then I think it's, it's a process. It's definitely um, something where it takes time to figure out what system's going to work best for you and your child. And it may change with time as they get older and they want to take more responsibility for managing their medications. They may be more interested in technology or using other tools. And I also just want to put in a plug for discussing your challenges with your care team with nurses, pharmacists, with your doctors. Because if you're struggling with certain side effects or remembering to take medications or getting refills on time, these are all things that we can help with. So now we'll go to the panel discussion. And some of the things we wanted to talk about were we wanted to open up for questions if people have certain questions about their medications and then sharing tips as far as what's worked well for you or what have you struggled with or what are you struggling with now? So with that, I'll open it up to the panel. Hi, I'm Scott Sereznak. This is my wife, Karen Sereznak. Um, we are parents of a 12-year-old daughter, Julia, who has scleroderma, was diagnosed about seven years ago. Uh, we have a unique perspective in that we're also in the medical field. I'm a pediatric cardiologist and Karen is a, a pediatric ICU nurse. So if there's anything that we can help with, we're happy to share any tricks that we've learned along the years that have helped uh, with our daughter. And any, we're happy to help with anything else as well. Hello, I'm Abby. Um, I have scleroderma myself. It runs down the back of my left leg. Um, I'm no longer undergoing treatment, but was undergoing treatment throughout high school and college. Um, I think I have a a perspective on it from both the patient side of it and also from now on the medical side of it as well. I'm a resident through UPMC for uh, family medicine. Hi, my name is Tara Jackson. I'm a registered nurse um, in the pediatric rheumatology department at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. I work with um, Dr. Katherine Torok. So my office is right behind her, so I get to hear her conversations and work with her and her scleroderma patients, along with also all of her other rheumatology patients. And I spend a great deal of time giving like tips and tricks for meds um, to patients and families just in our general day-to-day -day triaging of phone calls and seeing patients. Vivian, would you like Hi. to introduce yourself? Hi. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Vivian. Um, I actually work, I've been working in pediatric rheumatology since 2007. I've been a pediatric uh, nurse since 1994, uh, so it was a long time. But I've worked closely with Dr. Suzanne Lee, and um, any way I can help, um, I'd be happy to. So I think I was wondering if families in, uh, that are attending can put questions into the chat if they have any. But while we're waiting for that, 
Since methotrexate is commonly used as a first-line medicine for, for localized and for systemic sclerosis, Tara and Vivian, do you have specific tips and tricks for methotrexate? And then after that, if uh, Karen and Scott, you went away, if I don't know if your daughters needed this medicine or if you have the parent perspective, and then you too, Abigail. So I, the first, can you hear me again? I'm sorry. Yeah. This is, so the first thing I say to patients, to parents, is that, you know, be careful what you're Googling. If you're Googling anything, it should be from a reputable site. Um, it's one of the oldest medications that we use, so it's safe, you know, and we use a small amount. I mean, it's based on their weight, so we use a small amount that's needed to be therapeutic. And it doesn't work right away. It has to stay, you know, you have to keep taking it consistently. Um, and then if the doctor will evaluate how therapeutic it is. Um, there are side effects, but not every patient gets those side effects. Um, I think it does help to divide it into two days, like in t um, maybe one day, like on a Friday, and then 12 hours later, on a, uh, taking, taking the rest of the dose because it helps the absorption and therefore help it become more therapeutic. Thanks. Um, Have you done that even for uh, subcutaneous injections? No, not for subcutaneous, only if it's by mouth. We, we just by mouth. It That's right. Days, right. But sometimes we do use the, the injection form to take by mouth for for smaller kids that don't need the injection or parents that don't really want to give an injection. I think the doctor will decide if they have options. If they don't need to give an injection, then they can give the same vial, the form that comes in a vial by mouth and see how therapeutic it will be. Yeah, I also tell families, especially if their children are in school, to give them methotrexate either on a Friday night or a Saturday night so they have time to recuperate um, for the weekend. You know, we also tell some parents there's a little leeway. This is a once a week dosing. So if your kid has a sleepover on Friday and it's their methotrexate night, they can wait till the next day. It's not going to affect their levels or things. Um, along those lines. Um, also, when they do give the methotrexate injectable has an oral, I always tell, I tell some families you can put it like in Hershey's chocolate syrup, you can wash it down with like milk or apple juice, but not orange juice because it's too citric. And, you know, it just has to be a tiny bit of liquid to wash it down with, not like a whole glass of liquid to wash it down with. But the kids seem to like the chocolate syrup <laughs> the most to take with that um, little bit of the liquid injectable methotrexate that they give orally. Thanks. Also for um, our patients that are more like athletic or in sports, um, some have expressed that it may, you know, taking the methotrexate may slow them down. Um, so I say take it after, like after your meet or after your, 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 um, your game. Um, even if you're going, you have a special event like a wedding or something you're looking forward to, take it after that event. Yeah, good idea. So for us, um, like we said, our daughter was diagnosed uh, seven years ago. So she was around five and a half and we started with the injections. And our daughter had a intense fear of the needles, which was really, really difficult. And I remember the first couple of weeks ended with both her and I on the floor sobbing in the fetal position. It was really, really hard. Um, so one of Scott's coworkers also had a, a three-year-old at the time who was getting injections for something. And she had suggested doing it at night while they were asleep. And so we thought it was insanely crazy, <laughs> but we tried it and it worked. And that's really how we wound up giving her her injections for four years, probably about four years. Um, it, as she got older, it, at first we never said anything. We never told her that she was getting them and she didn't. Sometimes she would move. Um, we had to time it right with the sleep cycle and you know, we also were worried that we were like damaging her somehow by, you know, giving her a shot while she was sleeping. And I, 
I hope that we didn't do anything to damage her. But um, as she got older, um, she did know that we were doing it and she was, she understood, you know, why we did it that way. And she preferred it that way because she didn't want us to do it while she was awake. Um, and then she switched to oral, which made it a lot better. Um, we do split her dose. So we give her um, half of it usually on Friday night or Saturday night, and then the other half the next night. Luckily, she has not had many side effects from the methyltrexate. She does take um, the folic acid. Um, and I think that that's super helpful. Um, did you have anything else to add about? No, the only other thing I would add is that, uh, you know, she was five when she was diagnosed and uh, a lot of the other medications she was taking were oral and she couldn't oh, yeah. swallow tablets. Um, and luckily we went to our occupational health team uh, and they taught her how to swallow tablets at a young age. So if any of you guys have younger kids, I think you'd be surprised at uh, what occupational therapists can do. And you know, they taught her to swallow tablets at five. So uh, By swallowing candy first. So she started <laughs> with like birds yeah. and then, you know, progressed her way up to Tic Tacs and then it was m and um, So, um, and now she can swallow handfuls of medication. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a great point. At our hospital, it's the child life therapists that help with kids learning how to swallow pills, but yeah. it really does open up a lot more options for medications too, That some of which we didn't talk about um, yeah. we, um, today. On the parent group that I'm on on Facebook, a lot of parents do ask about the methotrexate and the injections and their kids who, I mean, what kid likes getting injections, right? So some of the things I've seen we've and some other things that we've done is numbing cream. Um, so uh, we just did it with actually my other daughter needed some blood work. So we did some numbing cream um, and that works well. There's um, Buzzy Bee, um, like a, it's like a vibrating thing that you can get that it's supposed to take your, um, take your uh, mind off of. Um, the injection, things like that. Yeah, those are great suggestions. We do use those a lot too. Yeah, the numbing cream, I think we don't always do a great job as providers of suggesting it proactively. Uh, so I'm going to take that to heart because I think we could we could just give people a tube of it and they can use it for lab draws or they could use it for injections and um, we should probably do that more often. She also um, gets IVIG. Um, in the beginning, it was once a month, and, and the IVs were super traumatic as well. And then just using the numbing cream definitely helps. I mean, she still uses it now. Yeah. Another good um, technique is the Buzzy Bee. I don't know if you've ever heard of any of you heard of that, Buzzy Bee. It's, um, it's using, um, it, was, it was in Shark Tank. It's a small... Like it vibrates and you add a cold, there's a cold pack to it. And it works like a gateway theory that if you can feel the cold and the vibrations, by the time you get the injection, you don't even feel it. And if you buy it on Amazon, um, there's different sizes, you don't need a big one. And it's it works really well because Emla is great, but with the Buzzy Bee, there's no time to for anxiety. Right, because you're just doing it in the moment. They're not you're not prepping them that here I'm getting MLA, therefore I'm, my injections coming. So it works really, really great. Yeah, here's the Buzzy Bee. We actually have them at our office. Um, when we do injections, like start injections at our office, or when we do joint injections, which are a whole other different thing, we use these Buzzy Bees. Our child life has them. Mine doesn't have its little wings on it, but it comes with ice pack wings and you can actually just buy it right off of Amazon and the kids love it because it's not it's good for like injections and blood draws and starting IVs and a lot of the kids really do like it and it causes like like Vivian was saying like an instant you know distraction so they're not waiting for their cream and stuff to work but it's a really cute thing it also not only comes as a bee it comes as a ladybug too so you have different options for whichever bug your kid likes best. Yeah, I think I've had mixed success with the Buzzy Bee over time. I think some kids kind of figure it out and they get so much anxiety that the Buzzy Bee cannot overcome it. But I think it's a great thing to try and it's not super expensive. 
and offices, if you don't want to buy it, your office, the your rheumatology office probably has one to try next time you come in. Abigail? Yeah, I was going to say, I think I'm the last one to go. Um, <laughs> I was diagnosed my um, sophomore year of high school. And so I have a little bit of a different perspective on everything. So I was older. I knew what was going on. Um, whenever we did come home with the medication on the first day it was injectable methotrexate. And my parents wanted to me, wanted me to be as involved as possible so that I could understand what was happening and why it was happening. So we actually practiced doing the injections on an orange just with water so that I knew what it would feel like to give myself the injection and what they were feeling and how to do everything sterilely so that I would be involved in the process and felt more safe about everything that was going on. Um, I think what Tara said, I really resonated with because we did plan the injections based off of what was going on on that weekend. I was in multiple sports teams. I had school events. I was in AP classes. So like I'd have tests on Monday, tests on Friday, things where we really had to balance that out in relation to actually taking the methotrexate. Um, I did have more nausea associated with it. I could almost pinpoint it to about three to three and a half hours after I received the injection, I would automatically become nauseated. Um, we managed that with additional medication. So Zofran was great. Um, we kind of started to work it out more towards that I would take the medication two to three hours before I would be going to bed at night. That way I would fall asleep right as the nausea set in. Sometimes I would wake up in the middle of the night with just my upset stomach. Um, but we kind of had a routine down. This was before the days of Netflix. So keep this in mind. Um, I had a DVD player. My mom bought me a whole stack of full house because of DVDs, like all 10 or 12 seasons and milk and um, cinnamon cookies would comment right down. If it didn't work within an hour, the rule was I woke up my mom or dad so we could figure out a solution, but I was a little older. So they trusted that if they gave me a little bit more freedom, which was nice. Yeah, that, that, those are great ideas. So someone uh, asked in the chat, oh, did you have something else to add? I was just going to ask Abigail if she ever had to take the Luke of Bourne. I know sometimes we recommend that to our patients who like the folic acid, you know, even with higher doses doesn't really seem to help the nausea very much. We have them take like a Luke of Bourne about 12 hours after they take their methotrexate to help some of the kiddos that just seem to have nausea more so than some other kids do. No, that's a good follow-up. Um, I know I had Zofran. I probably had Leucophorin as well to uh, help with it. I um, I think I was also, I, I can't remember how well it worked. I think it helped to decrease it down to where it was manageable and I could go about my day and it didn't disrupt anything. So that was very nice. Um, I think I started on pantoprazole or just like an acid, anti-acid stomach at the same time just for maintenance to help out. Yeah, those, that's another good option, the leucovorin. And we sometimes will try to do that for other um, side effects too. So someone asked a question about calcifications. They asked, for calming calcifications, is there a recommended medication combination? Ectemeral with Celsept, for example, is there a combination that works for dermatomyositis that might also work for scleroderma? I think that's a great question. It has not been studied to my knowledge. And even in dermatomyositis, uh, the treatment of patients that have really severe cal calcinosis is not, um, it's not well known. There's different things that have been tried. Uh, people will try the uh, suppressing the immune system first to try to get their disease under control as a whole and hope that that helps with the calcinosis but some people continue to get issues with calcinosis, which are these hard um, like calcium balls that are usually under the skin or in muscle tissue. And one of the things I'm aware of, although I haven't used it in a long time, is something called sodium thiosulfate, but there's a, a hospital, special hospital protocols for that medication to help with calcinosis, but that's 
would be something to ask your rheumatologist about. It's definitely an area that needs more study. And then they asked about magnesium too. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think there's any data on magnesium as far as helping with calcinosis. That doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just, it hasn't been studied. I think magnesium is a pretty um, benign supplement for the most part. So that would be something to talk. I can't make any recommendations on doses or anything um, in this setting, but you should definitely talk with your doctor about that. I don't know of any trials of IV sodium thiosulfate. I think there's also a topical version. Let's see. That's what someone just, I asked one of my um, colleagues that's a dermatomyositis expert, and she said, I, there's an IV sodium thiosulfate trial for patients with myositis that's going on at the NIH right now. So maybe that will help inform how we can treat um, calcinosis that's related to scleroderma too. Thanks for that question. Any other, let's see, did I miss anything else? Could I ask uh, you, Dr. Cooper, then what, what your thoughts are on uh, probiotics for GI symptoms? Uh, any thoughts overall on probiotics? I would like, I just saw Dr. Tora pop in the chat, so I'd love to get her perspective too, but I think that patients that have systemic sclerosis are prone to uh, bowel dysmotility if they get fibrosis in the gut, and that can lead to uh, bacterial overgrowth. So I think probiotics could be helpful, but I'm not sure if there's a specific one that they recommend. Dr. Torek, do you recommend a certain probiotic? She recommends talking with the GI doctor because they do sometimes have specific formulations um, that they recommend for different issues. I think it would also be great to hear how you all help patients deal with complex medication regimens. Like how do you help people remember their medications? How do you help teenagers start to take more ownership of learning about their medications, learning the names and starting to take on some of that uh, self-management? You wanna start, Tara? Um, so I think I like the idea of the pill pack. We actually have several patients here at our office that have very complex, like probably 10 or more pills a day, not necessary for scleroderma, but another disease. And they use the pill pack system, which is through Amazon is one place that you can get it at or any other like home delivery. I think like Express Scripts is another big one. And I really like it because one, she's a teenager and we're trying to also teach her that independence. And so everything comes in the pill pack. Everything's labeled with the dose and the name of the drug, which I think is good because that visualization helps them to remember what they're taking. And then they just pull it off their spool, they open it, they take it, and they're good and they're until their next dose is due. I mean, I think that's not just good for teenagers, but also adults who may have very complicated medi medication regimes. Um, if they're just taking a couple pills a day, the regular standard, you know, seven day pill pack, pill organizer is great. Um, I love the apps for teenagers, especially um, depending on what medication, if it's a biologic, every biologic company has an app that kids can log into, create their own profiles, set up reminders for, hey, this is your day to get your biologic. And then whatever you know body part you inject it into, it keeps track of that for you. I know that here at our hospital, we're looking into, we have um, transitioning to a, into adult care for like our older teenagers to kind of get them used to this is what you need to learn as you move into adult world, the name of your medications, who you need to call for appointments, what appointments do you need, how often to follow up. And I think that's good to start probably when they enter into high school because they're not 
adults, but they're very capable of learning these skills. And I feel like uh, if it's a longer process instead of like, boom, now you're 18 and we expect you to do everything, it works a lot better. And we're trying to get a program established here um, to, you know, work on transitioning kids into adult care, or even if they're going away to college, we like to set them up with rheumatologists if they're going way away from, you know, our hospital here. Um, you know, we want to connect them with the rheumatologist to handle their care while they're there for the next, you know, four to six to eight years, however long <laughs> they're gone at college. So I think transitioning teenagers is very important and to help them take control. And, you know, like Abigail said, learning how to give their own injections, you know, having them go over their medications with you is the first step to learning how to be independent and to manage your disease properly. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think it's really important to give each child the control that they need that's appropriate. And as they get older, uh, it's obvious they want more control. But if you can give them that control and give them that confidence that, you know, you're doing this to help yourself, if it's not going to help you, then you're not going to continue taking it. And that's the job of the doctor to make sure it's therapeutic. But if you make them realize that the injection isn't that painful, like Resuvo and Otrexa, they, they don't even feel it when they get those injections. So and some kids don't like pills, but they don't mind taking injections. It's odd, but that's what their preference is. Um, so we should listen to that. Thank you. I guess I can comment from, oh, okay. sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. I guess I can comment from moving from the high school phase into college and then afterwards, because um, I was taking different forms of the same medication throughout. So in high school, we started off with high dose prednisone plus the injectables. So um, for the first couple of months, my parents were the ones who actually did the injections, but I was expected to participate, to draw up the medication from the actual vial, to clean the skin and to do the whole nine yards. And then it kind of moved to more of a observation part for them. So they would watch me do it and they would comment or stop me if I was going to do something incorrect. Uh, it got to the point where as I was, was a sophomore when I started, by the time I was a senior, I was doing the injections completely on my own. They could be across the room making dinner, just keeping a, a wandering eye on me to make sure I wasn't doing anything super wrong, but I was primarily responsible. Um, as for the prednisone, we had uh, a pill box that was right next to, I think my cereal box to be quite frank. <laughs> so that I'd grab the cereal box and the pill box in the morning before I was going to school and that would be my cue to take the medicine. And then the same time that we would pick out for that day of the weekend to do the injection would be the same time that we refilled the pill box. And again, first couple of times they helped out. But then as it moved forward, we they taught me how to read the actual prescription on the bottle, which is difficult if you're just telling somebody to do it out of the blue yeah. and to actually the doses um, and use a pill cutter. So like the whole the whole nine yards so that by the time I was a senior in high school and we were talking about college at the very bottom of the list was talking about how am I going to manage my medications there? Because I was doing everything on my own. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Was, yeah, I also so was, like the suggestion great. of you tied taking your medications to something that you did every day, like eating cereal. I think that's another great way to help people remember. But I still like tra being able to track it somewhere because I think the things we do every day, sometimes it's hard to remember later in the day. Like, wait, did I do that? Did I take my vitamin with my cereal? Oh. It happened to me all the time. It's I, I kind of forgot if I took it or not, but I guess my thing fail-safe was I'd go home after school and if the pill was still in the box, then I would take it. Yeah. So it was, it was before I didn't have a cell phone I was in high school. So I didn't have an analogy with it. That's good. And then Karen and Scott, do you want to weigh in on how do you help um, your daughter keep track of her medicine? Well, we set our Alexa actually to go for an alarm to go off. Um, so she remembers it. She's, um, she's pretty responsible. Ours are actually on the kitchen table and we have the pillbox like the one that you showed 
um, in the beginning and you really- She'll often tell me, uh, you forgot the periactin this day. So, uh, yeah. she, so uh, if you ask her what her medicines are, are yeah. she will be able to tell us exactly what she's on. So I think uh, just in line with Abby was saying, I think sort of making sure they know early on what they're on, what they're taking, why they're taking it uh, is really meaningful. Yeah, I agree. I think we only have, is the session going, is the session over now or do we have a few more minutes? <laughs> I think it was only till one, right? I think so too. Okay. I think this is the end then, right? Time for closing comments. Okay. Well, feel free if anyone had questions that they didn't get answered. Um, I think you could still put them in the chat here and we would we can try to follow up with you and make sure you get your questions answered. Yes, I'll email those to you, Dr. Cooper. Okay, sounds good. And thanks. Thank you to the panelists for participating. It's awesome to have so many different perspectives. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. Thank you, everyone on the panel. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.